Thank you all speakers for a wealth of information you shared today. So we have quite a few questions from our participants. Um, we've kind of ordered them just in the order that they came in. So uh, it generally happened that after each speaker went, we got questions for that speaker. So you'll probably get them kind of in the order that we uh, spoke. Uh, please remember to the microphones, press the button in front of you on the microphone when you're talking. Um, otherwise, we won't pick up on the audio. So the first question is, are permits required to transport infe infectious agents domestically? Um, this is um, Von McClee um, from the CC's import permit program. Um, and in regards to the CDC's import permit regulations, um, we do not typically require an import permit to transport infectious material domestically. However, um, if you receive an import permit from our program with the condition of issuance that states that um, further transfer or moving it is prohibited, that does, to mean, that does mean that you will have to have an additional permit from our program to transport that infectious material um, domestically. And I'll leave my colleagues, um, APHIS, to answer that question further if they feel the need to do so. And I'm Deb Duffesey from USDA APHIS Organisms and Vectors Permitting. We require a permit for interstate transport of organisms or vectors that are pathogenic to livestock or poultry. The next question is, are you required to declare samples when passing through immigrations on the U.S.-Mexico border or can you pass through immigration with the samples and only open the container and show the permit if asked? I think that's for CBP to answer. Short answer to that is yes, uh, you have to declare it right at the primary if you're bringing in any uh, agriculture items or any uh, materials, biologics and stuff like that coming into the United States. Um, the uh, Agriculture Programs and Trade Liaison's Office through the uh, Agriculture Oversight uh, Division had uh, made a lot of effort to actually put uh, signage uh, on, at ports of entry that, that's in uh, land border uh, pedestrians as well as in passenger environment uh, where they have buses to and also in airport passengers that actually alerts and um, alerts the public to declare whatever materials, agricultural materials or biological materials that they're bringing in. So yes. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions about the importation of cells derived from uh, non-human primates. The first one is, do I need to obtain a permit from the CDC to import Vero cells, which were derived from African green monkey kidney cells in 1962, with a note that the cells are immortal and are free of any known infectious pathogens? So, <clears throat> excuse me, so this is Adam Langer from CDC's Quarantine Border Health Services Branch. Any uh, cell lines that are derived from non-human primates, uh, regardless of whether they're known or suspected to be infected with an infectious agent, require a import permit unless they have been rendered non-infectious. So since most of these cell lines would be essentially useless for their intended purpose, if they're treated to render them non-infectious, they will require a permit. And that is for Vero cells and any other cell line derived from non-human primates. Thank you. Um, we have a researcher applying for an import permit for human waste from healthy humans for research purposes, and we are unsure what vector to list since it's not known. What should we indicate on the application? Could you repeat that question again, please? We have a researcher applying for an import permit for human waste from healthy humans for research purposes, and we're unsure what vector to list since it's not known. What should we indicate on the application? Uh, this is um, Von McClee from the CC's Import Permit Program. Um, a, a key point that I think was made in that question was that this material was collected from healthy humans. Um, and with that being the case, um, if you do not suspect that, that those samples um, do not contain infectious biological agent, then um, an import permit from the CDC is not required. 
Uh, I will note that um, you must still have what we call a certification statement uh, with that material if you're importing to the country, uh, which specifically states that the material is not known or suspected to contain infectious biological agents and that the material is collected from an, a healthy human. Uh, this one is kind of for CDC and APHIS. Why is there no fee for a CDC import permit, but there is one for an APHIS import permit? Thank you. Uh, this is Deb from Organisms and Vectors Permitting. Uh, Congress gave us the authority to charge user fees in our CFR 9, uh, parts 1 through 200, and that is why we are authorized to collect user fees for some of our services. Um, as far as CDC, we do not have the authority to collect fees um, for, for import permits, and uh, I do not expect that to ever be the case, um, well, I won't say ever, but currently it's not the case um, um, for, for CDC at this time. Can we expect APHIS to provide a comprehensive list of which organisms or vectors are considered to be a threat to poultry and livestock, and if so, when? I wish I could go to a reference that tells me all of the organisms that are pathogenic to livestock or poultry, or humans, but I can't. If there were a, a list that were available today, tomorrow, it would be obsolete. We, we, our applicants are the experts in the subject of their organism and, and or their vector. And we expect that they would know whether these materials are infectious, or sorry, pathogenic to livestock or poultry. That being said, there are many resources out there that I use to look up some of the organisms that are requested on my applications. So we will eventually have a list that will be used as guidance, but it will be more the, com the most commonly uh, requested organisms. That list will come when we change from our e-permit system to our next system for for applications, which is called CARPOL, and I can't say when that will be available. Thank you. Um, since APHIS transport permits are need to be renewed each year, if you have an APHIS user account, would it be possible in the future for APHIS to set up automated renewable permits? Well, I guess my la the answer to the last question was a good segue to the answer to this question. Uh, the e-permit system is going to be transitioned into a new system called CARPOL. Within CARPOL, we will have a semblance of a list of organisms that, that uh, need permits. And we will be looking at automating some of the permitting available through this CARPOL system. And again, I, I, we're working on it now, and I can't say exactly when this new system will be implemented or how soon it will be until we actually get the automated permitting. Uh, this, another question for USDA APHIS. Um, is an additional fee required at the time of the inspection, and will fees be returned if it's determined that a permit is not required? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Of course. Is an additional fee required at the time of the inspection? Some inspections require an inspection fee. Import, or facilities that are inspected for import are charged an inspection fee, and facilities that are inspected for interstate transport are generally not charged an inspection fee for the inspection, but I cannot say if the actual person's travel time to get to the, to the area is going to be charged for. That is not exactly my department. We have people that are stationed all over the country that do our inspections for us, and they're under a slightly different system than we are, so I can't say exactly what those fees are or when they charge them, but except for the, the very basic stuff that I just said. The second part to that was, will fees be returned if it's determined that a permit is not required? And in, usually inspections are not performed on facilities that are asking for materials that don't require a permit. 
If that has happened on an individual basis, please give us, send us an email to ov at aphis, a -P -H -I -S, dot usda dot gov. If that's what the question was, the, uh, there's two, two possible ways that I can interpret this question. The other question is, when someone applies for our, our permits, they ask if, if the material is not within our jurisdiction or the permit is denied, they ask for that permit fee back. And it's actually, I'm using the wrong terminology, it's not a permit fee, it's an application fee. And that includes the, whatever has been done to decide whether or not to issue or to not issue that permit. So it's not refundable. Um, this is Abu Said from AFIS. I would like to add to that. Uh, I think also they wanted to know if uh, they already paid for an inspection uh, for a permit, and if you determine that there is no permit is required, whether they can get that fee back. Uh, we don't ask, we do not charge or initiate an inspection until someone submits an application. An inspection is initiated only when you determined a permit will be required and an inspection is required. Only then our, someone from our office will send a letter that you need an inspection and all of this fee for inspection will be uh, determined at that time. So there is no question of returning any fee if a permit is not required. Thank you. Um, when importing non-human primate samples, if the samples have no known agents, can section E boxes four through nine be left blank on the application? Or are we expected to list any agent we might be looking or testing for? Uh, this is Avon McClee uh, from the CC's Import Permit Program. I would definitely encourage you to include the agents that you will be testing for uh, on that application. Uh, when you submit it for an import permit. Thank you. I have two related questions uh, regarding carrying um, infectious material onto a plane. With regards to the import permit not allowing for taking questionable items in a carry-on, does this also pertain to the cargo hold in a suitcase or package? Could you, could you repeat the question, please? Of course. With regards to the import permit not allowing for taking questionable items in a carry-on, does this also apply to the cargo hold in a suitcase or package? The, um, like the, uh, the, the, well, if, if any importations that are supposed to be destined through a uh, cargo environment, uh, it, you know, whatever regulations that, that applies to it, um, um, you know, that's the, that's the only time that, uh, that that's when we, that's when we apply. Uh, anything else other than that, um, you know, anything that, that relates to the passenger environment usually has a different regulations compared to when you uh, look at uh, or review documentations or inspect luggages or, or uh, packages in a cargo environment. A, f uh, a related question is, my material was stopped at customs. I had an import permit, but was told the material was not properly packaged. What are the requirements to import infectious material in my checked luggage? I th um, well, at, at, the, at the port of entry, when, when CBP ins uh, inspect uh, uh, packages, and if it's got infectious materials on it, then it's subject to uh, Department of Transportation requirements. And I think I'm going to defer that to uh, our colleagues here from the Department of Transportation to make sure that the proper requirements for shipping and packaging uh, infectious materials are, are met. Bill? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, put it mildly, uh, and in general uh, format here, uh, if you have a permit, you have an infectious substance that should be packaged accordingly as we had talked about earlier and all. When you transport this on the aircraft, you cannot put this into your bag. You cannot carry it as a carry-on package. It must go into the cargo hold and you must inform the pilot uh, or through whichever agencies they uh, do that the pilot has notification that this hazardous material is on board. Uh, that is the standard general packaging. So. Uh, at that, I would obviously tell you before you get to the airport to contact the FAA uh, at the airport and confirm any additional requirements they have uh, specifically. 
But uh, no, you should not be carrying this on uh, your handheld baggage or try to stick it into your suitcase and uh, put it in there. Um, are any permits required to export material to the original sender after we have tested it? Uh, this is Wesley Johnson from the Department of Commerce. If, if it's something that we control on our commerce control list, if it's one of the agents that we control, by entering the United States, it becomes a United States item, and then export of that wherever it goes would require a license. Uh, this one's for USDA. It uh, reads, many biosafety officers complete USDA permit applications on behalf of the principal investigator. E-permits does not allow a person other than the principal investigator to complete the application. The permits must be in the PI's name for various reasons. Is there a plan to address this impediment to using e-permits? I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Sayed, do you have anything uh, to add? This is Abu Sayed. I'm trying to answer uh, if I can. Uh, so, if someone is trying to use an e-permit system, that person must be registered to our system. If the PI is the, PI is the only one who is registered, of course, he is the only one who will be able to enter. So if the biosafety officer wants to apply for the permit for, on behalf of the Prince PI, then he's allowed to do so, but to use the e-permit system, he must be authenticated in our system. So I would recommend to uh, go to our e-permit system and submit for uh, submit uh, authentication process for the biosafety officer. Uh, this one's for Dr. Langer. It says um, Dr. Langer referred to a list of ways to render animal products non-infectious. Does this list re does this list apply to animal feces? So the uh, list of acceptable methods for rendering a material non-infectious, which is on the CDC website, and I include the address in my slides, uh, would apply to any of the materials that are restricted by the Quarantine Border Health Services branch. Uh, whether or not those methods would be considered acceptable for uh, items that, for example, might be regulated by USDA APHIS, that's going to be up to them to decide. But as far as the animal products that I specifically mentioned in my portion of the webinar, then that list is comprehensive. Uh, this one's for USDA. If someone is ordering FBS, trypsin, or BSA from a U.S. supplier to be used as an ingredient in a medium that, and that supplier obtains the ingredient from Australia, then does the person ordering the ingredient need a VS permit? We require a permit for the importation of those products. And after that, hopefully we're right, we correctly assume that this material has been legally entered into the United States and there is no further permit required for interstate transport or intrastate transport from us. Um, this is Abu Said. I just uh, would like to add uh, to one of the replies that, uh, or one of the questions on the bureau cells, my CDC partner said that established cell line when uh, importing from outside of the country does not require a CDC permit. Still an APHIS permit may be required because on the fact that that cell culture might have used FBS. So just to point out that if, even if a CDC will not regulate, if that established cell culture like bureau cells has been growing on ever, have, if it ever exposed to an FBS, either US origin or not, it will require a APHIS permit to import it. I uh, believe this one's for the CDC. Please review when a certification statement is needed and what information does it need to contain? Um, the certification statement should be on official letterhead. Uh, which is signed by either the, the sender or the recipient. Um, it should include a, a detailed description of the material that you are importing and um, you know, a description of how that material was rendered non-infectious or a description of um, why you believe that that material does not contain or suspected of contain, contain an infectious biological agent. 
We have a few questions uh, regarding the inspection checklist. Um, just to combine all of them, where can the inspection checklist be found? Um, in regards to the CC's import permit program, the inspection checklists um, are located on our website. Um, you can feel free to, to access that um, along with our other tools um, that can be used um, to prepare for your inspections. Um, can, I, I, can I answer that one also? For, for USDA, we, we make our inspection templates off of the BMBL of suggestions, recommendations, and once you apply for a permit, as Dr. Saeed had mentioned before, once you apply for a permit, if an inspection is needed, then that inspection form will be sent to you and I believe to both the applicant and to the service center who will be doing the inspection. This one's also for the CDC. As we understand from the first presentation, the CDC import permit program will begin, to, will begin conducting entity inspections for BSL-2 permitted materials. What biological agents or activities will trigger these BSL-2 inspections? I, I wouldn't say that there is a, a specific agent that would, would trigger a BSL-2 type inspection. Um, lately, we have been um, having some issues with BSL-2 type facilities. Um, um, for example, um, facilities that are importing human body parts or facilities um, and importing blood uh, specimens. Um, so in those types of cases or instances where um, reviewing an application triggers a red flag um, for our program, we do still have the ability to inspect those um, um, BSL-2 type facilities. Now, majority of our, our inspection does close those higher risk facilities such as your BSL-3s or your ABSL-3s, but I, I did want to make the um, public aware that those BSL-2 um, inspect types of inspections are also of, of concern to us. Does APHIS require import permits for nucleic acid sequences for livestock or poultry path pathogens, even if they are not pathogenic? Yes, we do. Um, I'm sorry, this is referencing an FAQ. Uh, it says, question 18 of the Organisms and Vectors FAQ page states that APHIS inspections will, re will be required for any BSL-3 pathogens and selected BSL-2 pathogens. Is there a way for a list of these to be made publicly available in order to help prepare and assist permittees navigate the inspection process? We currently have a list internally of these organisms and their uses that require inspection. It's not just the organism, it's also the use. And we will be publishing them at some point in time. However, right now we probably we're going to probably get some input from our, our commodity centers, the people that, that take care of the, the cattle diseases and horse and sheep, and get their input as to what, what uses and what organisms they would like to see inspected. My guess is that our inspection list is going to be longer. But we don't have a, we don't have a inspection list at this time that for public at the, Sorry, no, no public inspection list right now. Uh, we have a hypothetical situation. If an influenza vaccine was developed using eggs and is imported from East Asia into the U.S., would that require an import permit from USDA or CDC? Could you repeat the first part or the first whole thing? Sure. If an influenza vaccine was developed using eggs and is imported from East Asia into the U.S., would that require an import permit from USDA or CDC? It would require an import permit from USDA. The type of influenza wasn't mentioned, uh, but it actually doesn't matter because the, the material was exposed to eggs from a foreign country. And East Asia is known to have, many of the countries have Newcastle disease or high path avian influenza that material might require safety testing unless the influenza is inactivated before import. Um, as far as the CDC, I would, I would say yes, um, considering that this particular vaccine has, been, has not been licensed or approved um, by the FDA or other uh, federal agencies within the United States. 
this one is for CBP. How does CBP know which agency to notify when reviewing documents for customs clearance of a package? For example, if a package of an infectious substance from a country where foot and mouth disease is endemic is received at customs and it has a CDC import permit, how would CBP know to contact USDA to verify all permits? Anything that has relation to uh, animal diseases, we refer it to USDA veterinary services. Uh, it, it doesn't make any difference if the import permit comes from CDC or APHIS. Um, if, if it's infectious, we, we would refer it. We, we would actually refer it to the two agencies to make sure if, they're, if they have equities on it, to make sure that in the process they're involved in the adjudication of the shipment. Uh, I have a couple more for CBP. Uh, well, maybe not. CDC has a presence at U.S. ports of entry, but not FWS and USDA. Does a lack of a physical presence of the regulatory agency or office at a port of entry lead to delays in customs clearance? Um, that's a very good question. Yeah, in a way it is. Um, th th there are instances, for instance, when we, when, um, uh, we would need not, not, not not just one, I mean, not just a referral to one agency, but to another agency. And sometimes, when when the other agency is not present at the port, then yeah, it it it, it results in delay. Uh, but the, the the process is that we make sure that in 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 any instance, whenever anything that comes out that that one agency has got jurisdiction over it, we make sure that they get notified and um, in 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 any form of communication process. Or method. Uh, this is also for CBP. How would one give advance notice to CBP about an incoming package? Is there a specific office that routes this information to the relevant port of entry? Um, I'll give an example for APHIS. Um, and actually, we, we started it with CDC too when we had the Ebola incident. But whenever there is an importation, for instance, um, um, in the process of applications for permit. Uh, in USDA, uh, they would actually also notify CBP that, okay, there is this incoming, uh, for instance, um, soil coming from a, a, a foreign country that's going to be hand carried or uh, uh, certain uh, uh, pests, for instance, that's going to be hand carried. So we get notification with all the information associated with that shipment. And I think we did a similar thing with CDC one time um, when we started, and I think uh, uh, Tom had mentioned it uh, in, in, in one instance when we had uh, um, uh, the Ebola uh, uh, materials coming in that uh, we did with one of the notification that was given to me in the process. So when it got, when it got stopped at um, a certain port, then I got called over it and uh, I got a call for it and then I was able to adjudicate it and that actually facilitated the process. So... I, I, I actually, from the CB perspective, I highly recommend that advanced notification because it, it really, uh, in, in cases, for instance, when we found discrepancies, we would exactly know which appropriate agency to communicate with to adjudicate the process. Is there any additional information related, related to FedEx's decision to stop transporting select agents? Um, at CDC, we continue to be engaged uh, with FedEx regarding this issue, and, and we'll definitely highly encourage that they continue to have an interest um, in shipping select agents. And I can tell you that we will continue to have further discussions with FedEx regarding this issue. I believe this one's for DOT. Does a Category B package have to explicitly say responsible person, such as is required for a Category A, or is the name, address, and phone number of the shipper sufficient? Repeat the first part of that, if you would, Tim. Does a Category B package have to explicitly say responsible person, such as is required for Category A? Or is the name, address, and phone number of the shipper sufficient? I'm going to say the name and address and phone number are sufficient. It doesn't have to identify, quote, responsible person, uh, according to the regulations. Uh, this one's also for DOT. 
is the suspected Category A entry for technical name required for all Category A substances or just select agents? The regulation uh, covering this is for select agents category, uh, excuse me, is for infectious substances category A, okay? Uh, technically speaking, you are not going to be wrong if you put a technical name there for your regular infectious cat A material. But for select agent, we want it to go with our concept of loss in the crowd and do not do it. Um, so this is for advanced notification of a regulated entry. Can the import broker do this or must it come from APHIS or CDC? Uh, for advanced notification, that should, uh, that should come from uh, uh, the permitting uh, agency, which is either APHIS or CDC. I think this might be for everyone. Can you please provide an anticipated implementation date for the ACE program for automated broker interface with other federal agencies? I think the, the target date for that is November of 2016, that uh, it will become the, uh, the centerpiece for trade uh, processing. I believe this one's for DOT. IATA requires the technical name to be included on the shipper's declaration of dangerous goods. Can you provide the reference in either IATA or DOT regulations that allows an entity to write UN 2814 infectious substance affecting humans? Uh, first off, IATA is not a regulatory book. Uh, ICAO, which is where IATA is derived from, as well as our 49, uh, of course, those two uh, books are regulatory. Uh, if you're going to play with uh, the airlines, uh, they follow IATA. Uh, but uh, in that, the site for uh, documenting on the shipping paper comes in a 172.202. I can't remember the, I think it's D, parenthesis D. Uh, but uh, it will say on there that uh, you are allowed to put suspected Category A infectious substance on the shipping document. Uh, we have a couple of questions about how to categorize human blood. Uh, will human whole blood shipped for diagnostic purposes be Category A or B? I don't, I don't think at CDC we're allowed to answer that question um, in regards to whether it's shipped as Category A or, or Category B. So I will defer that, refer that answer to Department of Transportation. Uh, we'll go back uh, to the fact that uh, these people handling this material are the experts in it. We do not classify a material. so. Uh, depending on the definition of cat A versus cat B, that's where that person must go to to determine. Is it that serious or is it not that serious? Okay, so again, DOT does not classify. Uh, this question is for USDA. Under what conditions can an import permit be issued to more than one permittee? For example, if the imported material must be tested by a U.S. government lab, can the import permit include both the applicant and the U.S. government lab as a permittee? The permittee is the person that's responsible for the material and the permittee, there can't be a, a, a responsible person in two different places. So I can't think of, a, of a, an instance where there would be two permittees. Saeed, did you have anything to add? No, we do not allow more than one permit on one permit. So one permit, one permit. If more institute or more people need, they should have their own permit. I'd like to add, though, that a permittee can allow other people to use their material, but they are still responsible for the material. The permittee is still responsible for the material. Uh, this question is for FDA. Do end use do end use letters require signatures from the end user or can the importer sign it on behalf of the end user? I've seen it in multiple ways. So the, it, 
we have to get at the heart of what is an end use letter. I mean, an end use letter is someone who's responsible for the product, whether it's the importer or the, the manufacturer in a foreign country or whoever was, you know, had the product at, you know, at some point of, of, of the chain of possession and they are attesting to what is in the package. So as long as we have a certification from someone that is at, in some sort of chain of possession, uh, I think we would be okay with that, but I'm not sure about the conditions for other agencies. Uh, this one I believe will be for CDC. Do we need a specific CDC permit to transport specimens between states that have tested preliminarily positive but have not been confirmed to contain agents such as MERS-CoV or Ebola? Well, I, I think there's um, two different answers to those questions, um, specifically regarding Ebola and, and MERS. Um, for Ebola, since it's um, a select agent, um, there's no need for a CDC permit or import permit. Um, you will have to have what we call a Form 2 transfer authorization approved by the uh, Federal Select Agent Program. Now, in regards to, to MERS, um, right now what we're requiring for MERS is that if you are transferring MERS to another facility, um, that you have to have an additional permit from the um, CDC's import permit program to, to transfer that material. Now, this is only for MERS that's imported into the country. Um, so once imported, um, if that condition is applied to your specific permit, um, then you have to have additional authorization to move that material to other places in the country. Uh, this one's for DOT. Are we required to have an en route plan for shipping any dangerous goods for each carrier that are utilized? Does it only apply to specific quantities or types? For today's discussion, uh, your transportation security plan is required for any amount of a select agent. Uh, that is first. Uh, under 172.802, <coughs> excuse me, you, <coughs> excuse me, you'll find the other applicability uh, interest of it. And primarily what we look at is bulk quantities of materials, i.e. over 872 gallon capacity container. Uh, would put you into a category of possibly needing uh, a transportation security plan, or if you do a PIH, a poison by inhalation hazard. Uh, those are different applicability things, but for today's discussion, any select agent, but a regular CAT-A, no. Uh, this one's for USDA. Does USDA have a published list of acceptable inactivation treatments for animal diseases? to better help the importer select raw material suppliers that can meet these criteria? Another short answer, no. Uh, this one's for FDA, and unfortunately I don't know what the numbers mean, so I'm just gonna have to. HTS code 30021002100, human plasma. Does not, allow, does not currently allow the FDA to disclaim option for human plasma clinical specimens to the, due to the FD2 flag. Is the FDA considering allowing this option for human plasma as it does now for whole human blood and human, clinical, human serum clinical specimens? I cannot speak specifically to that code off the top of my head, so I encourage the inquirer to submit their question to our email address so we can specifically address that. Thank you. Uh, does an overseas lab need to be inspected before sending or receiving biological material that requires an importation permit? I'm sorry, repeat the first part of the question. Does an overseas lab need to be inspected before sending or receiving biological material that requires an importation permit? Um, uh, for the CDC, um, the import permit regulations do not apply to overseas laboratories, so um, they will not have to be inspected by the CDC's import permit program. And this one's for USDA. Are the USDA APHIS import and transport permits separate, or can you have a permit that covers both? We provide a permit for import or a permit for transport. They're not for both. So it's, the, it's a multi-use application for import or transport, and the permit is, comes out as import 
permit or a transport permit. And then we have a general question asking where, where can the public find the 49 CFR regulatory books? There are obviously many sources uh, out there, whether it's J.J. Keller, Label Master, Mancom, uh, any of these, but of course you can pull it up uh, on the internet under ECFR 49. Uh, so it is accessible, and it is also on the FEMSA HAZMAT website. Uh, you can go there, and we've got the current version there also. And uh, we don't have anyone from PPQ, but we have one last question asking uh, where they can find a complete list of organisms which require a PPQ permit. I can't give the full answer to that, but I do know that they do have a list of organisms in their e-permits, but I don't know if that's a complete list. Um, so those are the questions that we uh, have re currently received in our mailbox. Um, if we haven't uh, been able to get to your question, we'll address them in the FAQs and post it on the website along with the video and the slide deck uh, for this presentation. Uh, that, was, that was the end of the question and answer session. Thank you, Janet. Now I am delighted to present to you and introduce Dr. Robin Wyant, the Director of the Division of Select Agents and Toxins. He will do the closing remarks. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Mueller. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Vaughn McClee and uh, Diane Martin and the crew at DSAT for putting this webinar together. This is, I believe, the third such import permit webinar that, that we have done. And, and based on, on the, the quantity and quality of questions that, that have come our way today, I, I think this was uh, uh, an extremely useful endeavor and, and, and an extremely good use of everyone's time. I'd especially like to thank all of our presenters, not only for traveling to Atlanta and, and providing exceptional presentations and uh, also exceptional answers to some very detailed questions. I don't think I know the, the select agent regulations as well as Mr. Stevens knows his DOT regulations that he can cite chapter and verse so well. Um, so thanks so much to, to all of our participants. Um, I just have a couple of, of, of parting thoughts, realizing that I'm the only thing standing between you and either supper or your, your trip to the airport. Um, one is the, the, the growing complexity of the challenge that we face um, in, in the area of, of permitting and imports and, and exports. Uh, the, the representatives of the federal agencies that participated in um, today's webinar really stand at the gate and they guard the gate of our nation. Um, and the, their job is becoming more and more complicated. Uh, many pharmaceuticals now um, have as just part of their routine development pipeline aspects of development that are done inside the United States, then outside the United States, and then back inside the United States. And, and in order for us to continue to be able to compete on the world stage in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, we have to be able to ensure that those imports and exports are, are done in a very efficient manner. Uh, likewise, um, we're seeing more and more global outbreaks. Uh, just this past year, we responded to the most significant Ebola outbreak on record that required uh, substantial transfers of, of critical clinical samples and isolates into the United States from, from Africa. 
It also required export of, of um, experimental vaccines from the United States to, to Africa. Um, all of this, uh, a very important part of, of these procedures was ensuring that these materials could go in, in and out of the United States in a very efficient way. So on, on one hand, our, our challenge um, is, is getting uh, more significant. Uh, and, and, and that's why another reason why I'm so pleased to see representatives of all of the stakeholders here today, because I think collaboration and coordination among stakeholders is absolutely critical for us to, to have an optimal system uh, in terms of efficiency of import and, and export. And I, I have great hopes for the upcoming ACE system in, in the ITDS in, in that they may provide us with a tool to, to enhance our efficiencies. Uh, so, uh, so much for the challenge of, of what we face. Um, the, the last, the very last thought that, that I would like to share with you is, is to take a step back and think about the end product of all of this work. You know, I, I was listening to the questions coming in, and there were a lot of highly detailed questions. I mean, we got deeply into the weeds, no pun intended. Um, but um, this past weekend, my wife and I were traveling in the North Georgia mountains, and uh, we encountered kudzu. Now, those of you that, that don't live in the southeastern United States may not know what kudzu is, but it was a plant that was introduced in the United States in the 20th century uh, from, from the Orient. It was thought to be some sort of, I guess, ornamental plant, but um, it was found to be extremely aggressive, and we've lost whole forests in the state of Georgia due to kudzu overgrowth. And um, when one thinks about the consequences of a release of an exotic organism or plant pest in the United States, it goes much farther beyond kudzu. One can only imagine the public health, agricultural, or economic consequences of a release of something like foot and mouth disease or polio um, in the United States. So I, I know this is a complicated business. It's got a lot of stakeholders, a lot of moving parts, but it is a critically important business uh, to, the, uh, to the health and security of our nation. And I'd like to congratulate our stakeholders on their excellent day in and day out work to ensure our health and security and I'd also like to thank our participants this afternoon for the great interest in these programs and for your help in, um, because together we, we can continue to achieve this overall goal of uh, safety and security for the United States. So with that, I'll thank you and uh, let you get your airplanes and your supper. That concludes our webcast for today. Thank you all for your participation.